it's here and it's so shiny. So because I'm a glutton for punishment, I bought this 2013 Mac Pro from eBay for the princely sum of £400. A little more than I wanted to spend, but it does have the D700 GPUs, which I wanted, and its manufacturing date was the middle of 2019. Yeah, just a few weeks before Apple announced the new 2019 Mac Pro, some poor sucker bought this. And now it's mine. And if you watch my earlier video when I chose this particular model on eBay, you'll know that it came with 64 gigabytes of RAM. The wrong RAM. It was 1600 mega transfers per second, not 1866 like it should be. So in this video, I'm going to swap that out, and I think you'll be surprised at the result. I'm also going to install an NVMe SSD and have some fun and games with the original, thanks to the seller not setting it up properly for sale. Let's get into it. So the Mac Pro arrived safely and it was pretty well packaged as you can see. And I was pleased to see that it's in good condition. It's not immaculate, but it's really not far off. I'm happy. And when I lifted off the outer shell, I found the interior to be clean and dust free. So that's a good start. Now my plan with this is to tear it down and reapply thermal paste to the GPUs because over time the thermal paste dries out and loses its efficiency. And since this Mac Pro needs all the help it can get to cool its components, it's a good idea to refresh it. I'm also going to swap the CPU for this eight core model, but that's gonna be in the next video. Uh, but first things first, I wanted to assess the condition of the Mac and establish some baselines so that I can do a comparison after I've completed the upgrades. So I plugged it in with this sadly non-original power cord and promptly found myself at a login window rather than a Mac OS setup screen. In other words, the seller had not properly wiped the Mac to prepare it for sale. And worse still, they hadn't provided me with the password. A couple of messages later and I got that password and logged in, only to find software still installed. Uh, some of it very expensive software and most likely in this case, pirated. And naturally, I decided to wipe the drive, only to find that there didn't seem to be a recovery partition. Instead, the original 256 gigabyte drive was partitioned and had two different versions of macOS installed. So I booted into internet recovery and started re-downloading the OS, but it said it was gonna take eight hours. And then I remembered that I still had my original 256 gig SSD from the previous Mac Pro that I owned. Here you can see the two SSDs side by side, and you'll notice the newer model which came with this Mac Pro doesn't have a heatsink. It was a quick and easy job to swap them over and it was a bit like traveling back in time because I booted into an old version of macOS with all my old apps and settings from four or five years ago. I then started a download of Monterey through the App Store, which was a mistake because it took most of the day to download the 12 gigabyte file. Then when I attempted to run the installer, it died with an error code and deleted itself. Through a third party site, I found a direct link to the installer on Apple servers and downloaded it again. And this time it took an hour, so it seems like Apple is throttling bandwidth through the App Store. It's a hugely frustrating waste of a day, but I finally got the system updated to Monterey, which is the last officially supported OS for this system. In a future video, I'm going to upgrade it to a newer version of macOS with the help of OpenCore Legacy Patcher, but for now, Monterey is fine. And everything works, the Mac is stable, I installed TG Pro, tested the temperatures and the fan, and everything looks good. Again, I'll do a separate video on setting up a fan curve with TG Pro. So let's get on to the first upgrade, which is the RAM. The 2013 Mac Pro should have up to 64 gigabytes of 1866 megahertz ECC RAM. You can install 128 gigs, but if you do that, it clocks down to 1066, and that does hit performance. Since this machine had been upgraded incorrectly with 1600 speed RAM, I was expecting it to perform slightly better with the correct RAM, but the difference was a big surprise. Before I did the upgrade, I ran benchmarks in Geekbench 5, and we got 749 for single core and 4376 for multi-core. That seemed a little low for the six core CPU that's in this Mac Pro at the moment. So I dug out the last Geekbench 5 test I did with my old Mac Pro, which had the 12 core CPU, and found that had a score of 776 for single core. And there's no way that the six core should be slower than the 12 core for single threaded performance. So let's install that correct memory. The RAM I bought is good quality, having been pulled from a 24 seven server environment. 
and it looks like it was supplied by HP originally, and it has SK Hynix chips. The install itself is really easy, only a simpleton could mess it up. You just remove the cover and swap the RAM DIMMs over, and then you boot it back up and check the total, and it says 48 gigs. Ah. Perhaps one of the DIMMs is faulty. Uh, well, I opened the machine back up and found that actually Simpleton here hadn't seated one of the DIMMs correctly. But after sorting that, it shows the correct amount of 64 gigabytes, and it's time to run the Geekbench tests again. And now we're getting 851 for single core and 4820 for multi core, which is more in line with what I was expecting, and is about 10% more performance for both single and multi core scores. And that's quite the difference. Putting the wrong RAM in this machine cost the previous owner that 10% of performance. That's a bit of a mistake. Of course, Geekbench 5 is an older test, but that's fairer for these older CPUs. The newer Geekbench 6 tests include more modern workflows like machine learning, which these old Xeon CPUs are just not optimized for. But for completeness anyway, here are the Geekbench 6 results. It's 790 for single core and 3718 for multi core. And I'm expecting a reasonable improvement on those once I get my 8 core CPU in there. Of course, it's nothing compared to modern processors, but it's still plenty quick enough. And in fact, I've been surprised at just how smooth and snappy this Mac Pro feels. It certainly doesn't feel outdated to use. Whilst I'm playing with Geekbench, I also tested the GPUs, because it'll be nice to have a reference point for comparison after I redo the thermal paste. And using Geekbench 5 and starting with GPU 1, which, if memory serves, is the non display GPU, it scores 28750 for Metal and 28611 for OpenCL. GPU 2 actually performs slightly better at 3146 for Metal and 29359 for OpenCL. It's not unusual to see some variation between the GPUs on these machines, and they do seem to be within spec. Individually, they're nothing to set the world alight. But in the few applications where you can use both of them in tandem, it's still pretty decent performance. And I'll be doing some more testing on that soon. Anyway, I'm happy to have uh, sorted out the RAM upgrade, and uh, I really like the look of these blue DIMMs in the Mac Pro. Now to tackle the SSD. And again, we'll need a before and after comparison. So I ran Blackmagic Disk Speed Test, which tests the sequential read and write performance of the drive. And the original Apple SSD scores are perfectly acceptable, 704 megabytes per second on write and 777 on read. Now, I've got a few spare NVMe drives lying around, so I've decided to install a 1TB Samsung 970 Pro. Remember that this Mac Pro is frustratingly PCI Express 2.0, despite this generation of Xeon chip actually supporting PCIe 3. So there's no point in going out and buying a super fast latest generation NVMe drive. Even this 970 Evo won't run at full speed in the Mac, but it should be a good deal quicker than the original. Apple issued a firmware update for the 2013 Mac Pro which allows the use of NVMe drives. So you want to make sure that you've got the latest OS installed before you remove your old drive to ensure you've got the most up-to-date firmware. I have a feeling it came with one of the Mojave updates. Now you could put the installer on a bootable USB and do a fresh install, but I decided to clone the disk instead using something called RescueZilla. It's pretty straightforward. You download the ISO, then write it to a USB drive using an app like Belena Etcher. What it does is writes the ISO to the USB drive and makes it bootable. Next, I installed my Samsung SSD into an external enclosure. And obviously, you'll need one of these if you're going to do a clone, as there's only one SSD slot in the Mac Pro itself. And now we can restart the Mac Pro whilst holding down the Option key on the keyboard to get the boot menu. From here, we choose our USB drive and boot into the RescueZilla Linux environment. It automatically starts the cloning app, and you just need to follow the instructions. Depending on the size of your drive, this might take a bit of time. It was just under 30 minutes in my case. Now we can shut down the Mac Pro and swap the SSDs over. Keep hold of your original Apple SSD, as it might come in useful in the future. You're also going to need an M.2 adapter, because the standard Apple SSD uses a different connector. I bought this one from Amazon for £9, and I'll put a link in the description. I also had this spare NVMe heatsink lying around, so I decided to install that to help with the thermals. The SSD sits on top of one of the GPUs, which probably isn't the best for thermal performance, so I figure the heatsink is worth a try. It is quite chunky, but there's plenty of space in the chassis for it. And that's the install done, and it worked fine. The Mac Pro boots first time using the new drive. But we still only have the same 256 gig capacity, 
because we need to expand the remaining partition using disk utility. As you can see, we've got this huge amount of free space. And when we click on that and press remove, disk utility then does its thing. But when it finished, I got this error message saying that it had failed. But then when I checked the container, it did seem to have successfully resized it. So I restarted the machine a couple of times for good measure. And sure enough, my storage now shows as a one terabyte PCI Express SSD. So let's run the Blackmagic disk speed test again. And we're now getting 1338 megabytes per second for writes and 1452 for read. So that's 90% faster for writing and 87% for reading. I'm pretty happy with that. I also ran Amorphous Disk Mark, which is similar to the popular Crystal Disk Mark on Windows. And here the speeds look even better for sequential performance, with the only limiting factor now being the PCI Express 2.0 bandwidth. So we've got our Mac upgraded to the latest Monterey. We've improved performance by installing the correct RAM. And we've almost doubled our SSD performance in addition to quadrupling the storage space. Uh, this is already becoming a very nice machine but it's gonna get even better once I put that eight core CPU in it. This is the E5 2667 version two. So it's got a slightly higher boost clock and much more cache RAM per core than the six core CPU in this model. So I'm expecting the best possible single core performance and a reasonable step up on multi-core. This should be a pretty fantastic all round machine when I'm done. So get subscribed if you wanna see that full teardown and don't forget to ring the bell to be notified when we release that content. Now you can also support the channel by clicking on our Amazon links. It doesn't cost you any extra and you don't have to buy the things we've linked to, but if you do make any purchases, the channel earns a small commission. So thanks as always for your kind and generous support. And we'll see you again soon for some more geekery.